and welcome back to the Wellness Paradox podcast. I'm so grateful that you've joined us on this journey towards greater human flourishing. As always, I'm your host, Michael Stack, an exercise physiologist by training and a health entrepreneur and a health educator by trade. And I'm fascinated by a phenomena that I call the wellness paradox. That paradox is the gap between what we know as a health sciences community and what we actually implement in the real world to make a real difference with real people. This podcast is all about closing off those gaps by disseminating the latest, most evidence-based, and most engaging information in the health sciences. And to do that today, we're joined by Palav Sharda. Palav is a healthcare technologist who has a very interesting background. As you'll hear in this podcast, we'll talk about his journey from medical school to healthcare technology. This is such a critical conversation right now with all the information that swirls around out there regarding our own personal medical histories, what we can do with that data now, and what we'll be capable of doing with that data in the future. This is particularly in light of the fact that some laws regarding data privacy and data sharing in the healthcare space are starting to change and likely will evolve rapidly in the coming years. I think this is a critically important conversation for us all to understand, not just for the benefit of our personal health and that data, but also for the benefit of healthcare as a whole. I really hope you enjoy this conversation with Palav. Any additional information that we talk about during the podcast can be found at the show notes page at wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode nine. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Palav Sharda. All right, well, we're joined on the Wellness Paradox podcast by Palav Sharda. Palav, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Mike. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I uh, feel honored to be on the Wellness Paradox. Awesome. And, and Palav's joining us uh, from the West Coast, from San Francisco. So we, we appreciate him getting up a little bit earlier out there to join us. Uh, we're going to launch into a really interesting discussion today around healthcare, healthcare technology, and all the disruption that, that is happening and, and will likely keep happening in that space. And, and Palav has a very extensive background in this area as we're gonna talk about. So I wanna jump right into it with first, just a little bit of your background, Palav, just to give our listeners some context that you bring to this conversation. Talk a little bit about your journey and what's led you to the point you're at. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's been, uh, I'm celebrating my 25th year in healthcare. Um, the first five or, or so were uh, medical school training as a physician. And then I took, a, uh, took an exit from that temporarily, I thought, for, as a sabbatical into health IT. And uh, in 2001, I joined Columbia Presbyterian uh, New York City uh, in master's in medical informatics program. And since then, I've been full-time in enterprise health IT or startups so I'm here after having done a few years at G Healthcare, Kaiser Permanente, a United Health Group, uh, ran a few startups, and uh, I've been at Google for the last three years. So that's, uh, that's me. Yeah, quite a, quite a winding road there. I'm curious about something in your background that as much as you talked about the tech side of things, you also mentioned the, the med school side of things. Uh, what caused you to say, you know what, I, I'm medical school is great and being a physician is great, but I'm more drawn to this, this IT technology side of things. What, what caused that pivot? Yeah, you know, things make sense when you're looking back. Uh, and I will admit that at, point, at that point, I wasn't super confident about what I wanted to do next, but I was uh, in my uh, junior residency for anesthesia and I had always been tinkering with computers uh, all through med school. I had programmed and back then was COBOL and Pascal and um, broken a few computers, uh, tried to fix them. And I think at that point, medical career was looking far too predictable. You know, everything 
was you need you do you do residency, you do fellowship, you go out there, either start your own practice or you join an enterprise. Uh, and I guess at that point in, in time, that just didn't feel like something that defined me. Mm. And I now realize that when you wake up every morning and you feel like doing something, you should probably make a career out of that. And back then I just couldn't get wait to get back from, from my clinical duties or, or med school and just get back to, you know, even if it was a game on my, um, on my 586 machine. And uh, I had good advisors back then who told me to take a break from what I was doing and just see where, uh, where computers science takes me. Uh, luckily, around that time, 1999, uh, the Y2K scare was there. And I think technology got a disproportionate share of people's attention. Mm. So there were a few people uh, in my friends and family circle that, uh, that jumped into it, uh, were there. So it all just like, I think the, the strength to try something else was not entirely mine. Uh, it was friends and family who supported that decision. But, uh, you know, one thing led to the other. And this principle of waking up and being excited about what what I was doing just kept taking me more towards technology. Yeah, that uh, that certainly resonates with me and probably a lot of people that listen to this podcast. Sometimes is it's the path less traveled, but it, it's it's the more fulfilling path. Yeah, I do think though it is a very interesting perspective that you bring to the table because you do have that form of medical training, but as a clinician, but you also have a technology background. And I'm sure I'm not the only one that said that to you. So I want to. I want to dive into the book that you wrote because when somebody takes the time to write a book, that's not a not a small undertaking. And in, in 2016, you published a book uh, before disrupting healthcare: uh, What Innovators Need to Know. What inspired you to, to take that leap and to write that book? Yeah, it was uh, again something that uh, was more of a catharsis than uh, some uh, you know a planned exercise. Uh, so. The timing of the book kind of led to its its genesis. It took a couple of years to write it. So really, my my impetus to write it was around 2014. Mm -hmm. And that was the time when Affordable Care Hack Act had passed and survived a couple of Supreme Court uh, sort of blows. And the, the, the definition of accountable care and sort of new constructs in the industry were generating a lot of interest from non-healthcare people. So, you know, a lot of my technology, and I was uh, in st doing my own startup back then. So my, my ecosystem had changed from healthcare insiders to actually healthcare outsiders. So wherever I went, there were people who had done tremendous work in online retail or Amazon or, or, or some other place. And they were now like looking at healthcare and had their own startups uh, thinking about healthcare. And whenever I spoke with them, and you know, this is the classic um, Bay Area ecosystem where when you have coffee with somebody, you somebody wants to have coffee with you because you're like a healthcare insider and they want to know, like, what do you think of like what we're doing? And every time I spoke to somebody like that, I was shocked that they didn't know the the technology pieces that already existed in healthcare. So, you know, it's easy to for you to for somebody outside to uh, to think of healthcare technology um, systems as suboptimal. But the truth is, w when you go see your physician or get a lab test, it does get electronically captured. Y you do get re lab results, maybe late, uh, maybe not in the best form that you want them to be on your phone or whatnot. But something gets generated. There is a transaction that gets recorded. You get billed for it or your insurance gets... All that stuff is is there has been there has evolved so e-prescribing uh, computerized order entry just the history and physical that your physician types into or uh, the medication list that gets generated and um, all that all those constructs were not being exposed from a technology product management perspective and I had started writing uh, uh, a number of answers on uh, Quora. I, I don't know if you know the website, but um, Quora was pretty popular back then. And as I was doing my startup late night, 
uh, so questions like what's a master patient index uh, popped up on Quora. And I spent like 45 minutes explaining what it was. And I had a few answers like that, that were getting a lot of views. And I was, I, I kept feeling like there was no book that explained what systems exist in healthcare today that can then be disrupted in the right way. So I called it, you know, tongue in cheek before disrupting healthcare, because I felt like all the entrepreneurs and investors, um, like there was a famous uh, conversation that actually, I think just tipped the scale for me where this great entrepreneur, um, very successful outside of healthcare. And he showed me his decision support application on an iPad for cardiologists. This was like 2013 or somewhere there. And it had no, and he had no integration plans with Epic or Cerner or any, like any EHR. And he was literally like uh, EHRs. So sure, like we'll integrate with them. And I felt like, and he was a Y Combinator alum. Mm -hmm. So I felt like there's this tremendous talent and enablement and they're just going to like arrive at the doorstep of actual healthcare and, f and flounder for no fault of theirs. Uh, so it'd be nice to inform them of what I already knew um, because I feel like healthcare is not like, uh, not like Uber, uh, or, you know, like you, you can't just like come in and disrupt taxi unions and take over the whole industry. There are uh, existing pieces of the puzzle that are very hard to displace are regulate, you know, uh, have regulations around them. So rather than repeated attempts uh, crashing at the shores of uh, conventional healthcare, I thought um, describing those systems would be helpful. And that's why the book came out. Yeah. And, uh, and I did have the chance to read the book. It's, it's a very good read and it's a good, it, it's a great read for people who um, don't have a strong understanding of that existing technology ecosystem. And, and I did going into the book, uh, certainly not anywhere near the level that you, know, you or experts in that space have, but it clarified a, a lot of things for me. I think something that might be helpful before we dive deeper into this discussion is just to level set for some of our listeners with some terminology here. You actually do a really good job in the book of, of uh, identifying terminology, e EHR, EMR, PHR, you hear these acronyms thrown around. You even mentioned, you know, Epic and Cerner, which, you know, briefly I'll say those are pretty much your two predominant uh, EMR systems. The Coke are, and Pepsi of yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Um, what would be helpful terms for just us to know as we go into this discussion for maybe the person that doesn't understand the the whole um, healthcare technology space all that well? Sure. Well, thank you for the kind words about the book. It was a labor of love. I didn't really expect to make any monetary gains from it. Uh, you know, it all is is uh, is Amazon uh, driven, but uh, it's admittedly a dry topic for somebody who's not already interested in it. So, uh, thank you for for indulging. Um, I think the two terms that we should know, or anybody who's interested in technology and is looking at healthcare, should know are uh, electronic health records and health information exchanges. They're very complementary constructs of systems. So electronic health record is basically like your point of sale system uh, at, you know, at a restaurant. It, it's admittedly much more complex, but the moment uh, a healthcare transaction happens, everything around that from scheduling to billing to actually recording what, what happened to you happens in an electronic health record. And lines keep getting blurred because you know some of the EHR vendors create HIEs and some of the HIE vendors create functionalities that are like that are for EHR. But health information exchanges, HIEs are to me that the complementary view. So EHR captures everything that it that happens within the four walls of a facility or a a large healthcare system. Um, HIEs are what happens outside. So a regional network of, uh, uh, of, uh, of stakeholders, whether that's a large physician uh, organization, a couple of large hospitals, an insurance company, a government uh, run organization, they all get together and they, uh, they create this governance structure called an HIE. So some of the famous HIEs that I worked with were the Bronx, Rio Regional Health Organization, 
Um, Utah has one, Indiana has one. Um, they tend to be at a, at a geopolitical level where there are multiple healthcare stakeholders. And the idea behind the HIE software is to help exchange information between these regional stakeholders. Um, so if you were uh, the largest two hospital systems in the, in the region, you didn't have to duplicate work sending immunization data to the state immunization registry. You just send it to the regional health information exchange and the health information exchange has one connection to the state registry. There are many examples like this, but basically creating this um, intermediary body that, uh, that can centralize some of the needed information um, and be able to disseminate it to, to other stakeholders. That's the HIE. So EHRs and HIE are two concepts that you should know. They exist, they have, uh, they have large repositories of data, they have their own operating systems, so to speak, uh, their own enterprise class software. And uh, as we get into a world where longitudinal view of, of a patient's health is important, you cannot miss either of those um, data sources. Right, so we, we have the, the, the health records that are internal and then we have the information exchange that's external that basically connects all of the various stakeholders internal records with each other for, for lack of a better way to put it. Yes, just the two sort of footnotes to HIEs are, uh, they were started back after Affordable Care Act and they're not necessarily exchanging all the information, it's a subset of information. So if Michael Stack uh, visited California, your state HIE will give us the problems, medications, allergies, uh, and diagnosis for Michael Stack. But your, uh, you know, hopefully your latest lab result, but you know, your entire history might not be always available through the HIE. Think of it as like the minimum viable uh, set of electronic health records that are, that are exchangeable. Um, so that's so that's one. And um, HIEs don't exist everywhere. Um, sometimes they only do messaging. So they come in different shapes and forms. But they were started with public funding, so they are not really flourishing in the exact same way everywhere. It would be nice if they were, but uh, some states have ran out of funding. Some regions have kind of found a business model, so they've, they're doing more. But um, but they come in different varieties. Yeah, what strikes me as you're talking about this, and this, this, I may be over, overly naive in, in asking a question like this because I don't understand the, the space, but what happens when there is not an HIE available? Let's say that, you know, Michael Stack goes to Wyoming, ends up in the ER, and there's not an HIE in Wyoming, let's just say, that can get my information there, and it's stuck in a health system here locally in Michigan. What happens then? Yeah, that's the that's the, the unfortunate part. You know, a lot of this exchange, this kind of exchange, with no prior existing connections, will still happen through fax. Uh, your emergency, oh, God forbid, emergency room doctor will be will ask you who your primary care physician is, and they're gonna just call the office of primary care doc and tell them to fax the records over at a certain number. That's it. Yeah, that's how it still happens most of the times. Hmm. That's, uh, I I'm struck by the facts in 2021. Like I realize we have digital faxes now and no one's exactly running over to the, the old school fax machine, but that, uh, that's fascinating. It, it seems as if this health information exchange is a critical part of the healthcare technology infrastructure from what you're saying. It is, it is. Because, you know, you, we may all sort of uh, shake our heads at facts, but Fax takes care of, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a proponent of fax, by the way, but I'm just saying some of the simplicity of fax is, you know, it, it helps identify. So the identification is kind of built in. Uh, where you're faxing things is probably owned, you know, it, it, you're being given a number that's already owned by a certified institution. Who you're calling, and if you're saying, hey, I need records of Michael Stack, here's, uh, uh, here's my NPI registry number. I'm a physician here. And that identification check happens annually over the phone. Mm -hmm. So if you were to get rid of facts, you'd have to figure out which Michael Stack are we talking about? Uh, you know, is this person authorized to talk to the other person? 
And if it is, uh, you know, like, how are we going to send information securely? So I feel like transforming that workflow into completely uh, digital systems and exchange raises these, um, this under the water iceberg type of pieces that are massive. Like if you think about it, social security numbers are the identification um, for, for every individual in the US. And not everybody has a social security number. And we've had contentious debates in the Senate and um, in the House about creating a national patient identifier. That has been going on for decades. So till we have resolution on how to not use social security, but use some other number to accurately identify a person, even if you'd get rid of facts, how are you going to De, you know, figure out which person you're going to get information for. I mean, there are other other ways to, you know, there are commercial companies like Equifax who identify people and there's other things that you can do. But all I'm trying to say is it's not as simple as just replacing facts because there are underlying components that need to be built at a national level to enable this kind of interoperability. Yeah, it's a... Uh, it- it seems, I think in, in 2021, we think that technology is always the answer and it's just as simple as, as coding some kind of application. But what, what you just said there is shows the subtleties and the nuances of, of this innovation. And I think it goes back to your point that you wrote the book on, which is there's just some fundamental things you need to know about the space before you go in to disrupting it. And I think that is, that's certainly something that I think a lot of people that aren't in the space wouldn't necessarily realize. Yeah, yeah. One thing I'll add to to the discussion is I feel like people tend to gravitate towards technology and start dissecting it as the solution. I feel like it's more important to talk about incentives because technology can always come in and solve something. Um, What's the incentive for somebody to solve the problem and in what way is important? So I'll give you a great example. So I talked about identification and sort of like disseminating interoperable information to any point in the country. Uh, it sort of happens for your prescriptions. So if you get a prescription in um, in Michigan and then you, you forget it when you're traveling to Florida, you could actually talk to Rite Aid and and get the prescription electronically sent to the pharmacy near you in Florida. And that happens because there were e-prescribing laws that got enacted 10 years ago. Uh, There's a company or two, Shorescripts being the biggest one, that has the chain and and the software for for creating this e-prescribing workflow. So our prescriptions are flowing because I think you can see how that is aligned with the industrial complex of pharmaceutical companies, uh, you know, dis- dispensing the right prescription, right time uh, leads to better outcomes. And they want to have, mm-hmm. have, have that happen. So as long as we have incentives, I think technology can have the answer. It's just uh, shouldn't look at technology first. Yeah, yeah, a- absolutely. It's, uh, it, we jump to technology because it's so ubiquitous, but there, I think sometimes it's what, what's the, the, Einstein statement, I believe it's, you know, everything should be as simple as possible, but no simpler or something like that. I feel like, I feel like that applies here. Well, I want to carry the conversation forward because we are talking about innovation and disruption here to a certain degree. And I think, you know, healthcare is a space that's ripe for that. As you consider that, you know, close to 20% of our gross domestic product is, is going to healthcare and it certainly has its challenges. From your viewpoint, especially with regard to healthcare data, because we're amassing so much of this data, um, how is how is data being used to drive inter- innovation, and what opportunities do we have to leverage that? And then maybe even go a step further to where we're falling short. Data uh, certainly has all the attention now for the last few years. So think of data as in coming from three different buckets. So one is the conventional bucket of your clinics or hospitals that you visit as a part of a healthcare transaction. Whatever your doctor types into, whatever the the nursing staff types into, all that clinical conventional data is, let's say, one category. Then there's another category of community-generated data. And you can kind of think of HIEs as one of them. 
but there are many other data sets. There's state, uh, state public health data. There, there are immunization registries. There are prescription uh, databases at, at state level. Um, so that's like the community data. But then, then there's also a data of what I data category for what I call at home, or pers- you know personal data for for the patient. And this could be you, you know a simplistic example, your Fitbit, or it could be the glucometer that your uh, physician gave you to ke- keep record on your blood glucose. But basically, patient generated data that is away from a care setting. So if you think about these three settings, I think what's happening right is that the at-home patient-generated data has started finally getting uh, the attention that it deserves. So uh, it's almost, I mean, it's almost like it's not even debatable now. If you're a hypertensive and the only blood pressure reading that you have is when you actually went and visited your primary care doctor, that's not good enough to give you a medication uh, that we can titrate with your uh, disease. Although, it, it, you know, it's better than nothing. But what has, you know, new co- digital health companies like Livongo or Verda Health or Omada, what they've started doing is gather the other side of the um, data. So all your blood pressure readings from the smart device, uh, you know, blood pressure monitors that you have at home are now being incorporated as a part of your continuous medical record. And it's much better to have a, a, a BP reading from th- three times your, in a day and then titrate your medication based on that. Um, I mean, I do that for my mother and uh, you know, we, we've constantly sort of like shifted uh, dosages because we had a better view of her uh, condition. So data is doing a data generation and attention is, is going in the right direction for the at home part of data. Um, I think what we're st- where we're still lacking in terms of data is not the the deficiency is not in the data itself. It's actually zooming out and looking at different pieces of data and connecting them. Mm. So, for example, if you if you had a patient that that had a, a ton of like hypertensive, you know, diabetic, uh, but controlled diabetes, had an acute episode, got admitted had a hospital stay for three days and now is coming back home, right? So all that data about um, their previous blood pressure readings or blood glucose readings, what medications were given in the hospital and what they are being discharged with and who gets it, it maybe a, a nurse or an adult child gets it at home and do they understand what needs to get done, like which med to take empty stomach, when to take the other one, what if you miss a dose, All that continuous sort of um, interconnections between these data points, we're still a fragmented system. Mm -hmm. So, and and that is not because of technology, it's because of incentives, because the primary care doc has incentives to to look at uh, who you are and what medications you have after you've got discharged and now are coming in to see your PCP again. Mm -hmm. The, the ICU doc in the hospital had an incentive to look at you for seven days that you were there. So we really need a, a, a system that rewards uh, caregivers for having a longitudinal view. And I think bundled payments and accountable care is getting us there. But you almost need uh, you know, a role of a care navigator or a constant um, uh, chronic care management uh, resource that can that can work with you to tie all these data points together. Um, so, so we're lacking in that. Yeah, I think that's. I'm very glad that you mentioned that because the the concept that this podcast is kind of based on is that we are siloed as a health sciences uh, just field as a whole. And you're even talking about the silos that exist with within the medical model. And just to hit on this, not that I want to talk too much about the payment reforms and things like that, but maybe just touch on briefly, you talk, you mentioned ACOs a couple times. Um, you also said you know, bundled payments and care navigator, maybe just give people a little bit of a context for what you're talking about there. Cause I think it's very, it's very germane to discussion of technology because they, these things don't exist in a vacuum. They, they, they exist in the same ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm trying to, so I'll explain it in a very simple way and it may not be the exact way, but the concept will, will carry through. So you can pay for healthcare in a, in a transaction fee for service type of way. And that's a term that people use fee for service where you, you walk in with an ailment, you get treated, and then you owe the bill for that problem. And that's how it usually happens. Um, although the bill is paid by our insurance companies, but that is, you know, the entire transaction gets billed uh, individually. So let's say you had toenail fungus and you, you walk in, you get uh, medication and you, you get a bill for the entire, um, your, your insurance company gets a bill for, for the entire duration. Now, healthcare's had a concept of capitation where there is a fixed price for a certain context. And then no matter how many times you come in, no matter how many transactions you have, the fixed price remains. Um, so you can think of it at a, at a higher level for more complicated things like hip surgery. Uh, a lot of employer uh, benefits are, are structured in a way that the employer pays a set amount, like $30,000 to a, a hospital for hip surgery. Now, whether you need 10 classes of physical therapy after hip surgery, whether you have a seven day stay versus a five day stay in the hospital, it doesn't matter what they end up paying is $30,000 every time there's a hip surgery uh, for one of their employees. So that's, that's the employer point of view. That is a bundle. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more bundles you have, the more predictable, um, the more predictable the transactions are because healthcare basically is a, is an inexact experience, right? Because there's very few things that you can go in and say, all right, I'm not going to, you know, ever come back for this problem again. Usually things spill over you, you know, everybody has exceptions. We're all different. So how to encapsulate a, a, a basically variable experience into a defined set of payments or outcomes is what capitation and bundled payments have, have tried to do. And they can only do it for, uh, for disease contexts that are, uh, that, are, that are aligned with this kind of encapsulation. So uh, hip surgery, you know, orthopedics is a great field because they have, uh, you know, enviable outcomes. They have a very predictable care pathway. Um, and a lot of bundles today, the successful ones are in orthopedics. The other things that can be bundleized, uh, if I can make that word up, can be pregnancy. A normal pregnancy is quite predictable. Uh, how long do you stay? How many prenatal visits do you have? It's already kind of like ha happens on a, on a very predictable flow chart uh, in the world today. There are other things like that. Uh, but as we take chunks of healthcare context and create a predictable um, set of requirements and outcome from it, then you can also predict the payment that's required for it. And that's the view of, uh, of accountable care and bundles world versus you have a problem, you come back in. If you had an open heart surgery and then you develop a complication, you come back in and you know you get billed again for that. Although the complication was from the surgery and not really your fault. So that's the two different. Yeah, great. Yeah, I appreciate that. Because again, we have a lot of listeners to this podcast. I think many of which will know capitation and bundled payments you know, right out the gate. And I think other people are you know, flipping through Wikipedia right now, trying to find those. But the, to circle back around to the original reason that we asked that, we talked about you know in lot aligning incentives to some degree for the different stakeholders you know, with regard to utilizing the technology effectively. And and it's not a perfect model by any stretch of the imagination, because as you said, there needs to be some predictability in the care workflow, um, and certain conditions don't lend themselves to that. But but others do, and I think that that. That is a, a separate part of the discussion, which incidentally, uh, we do have some episodes on in the future where we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that. But, but I want to circle back around to uh, the healthcare uh, digital innovations and, and your world that you work in. And there's recently been a change in legislation with regard to healthcare data sharing laws. And I think this was a blip on you know, most people's radar where they heard it and they're like, oh, well, that, that's, that's interesting. Uh, but when I heard it, I know my ears perked up, and I'm sure yours did as well. Uh, talk a little bit about this and, and what it might mean downstream. 
Yeah, this was a, a pretty big deal uh, in healthcare technology, information technology sectors. So beginning April 5th, 2021, um, CMS, which is the, the highest operating agency for healthcare in the, in the nation, they implemented what was called a 21st Century Cures Act. And that requires healthcare providers to give patient access without charge to all the health information in their electronic medical records without delay. So th this has been called the information blocking rule. And um, people who are unable to access their personal health information um, or who are not being provided this information uh, will can, can submit a report for information blocking through the US Department of Health and Human Services. And uh, there are fines like up to a million dollars. So um, I think this opens up the floodgates for a lot of inflow and outflow of information. Because previously, um, if, if you've ever had this experience, you have to pay some charge like a dollar or 25 cents per page. And then somebody faxes you that information or mails it to you. And by the time that happens and you, you get it, you, the need for doing it has already you know, passed. Um, so I think by, by, by creating this information blocking rule and asking providers to have the ability to do it without delay, they are incentivizing, the federal authorities have incentivized uh, the creation of electronic ways of opening the tap. And once that happens, you know, a thousand flowers will bloom because we're basically starving for information that has been collected within the four walls of, uh, of a provider organization. So uh, my experience with, uh, with federal rules and regulations is you can never tell exactly when the impact happens, mm -hmm. but the good news is, uh, you know, it has started happening. So there may be some lobby pushback uh, on this. Maybe the rule gets diluted a little bit. Maybe the, the implementation timelines get extended by a year or so. But we can look at like the five years from now and the ability to hit a button on your hospital's website to say, I need my information and getting, getting it sent to a place in a machine understandable way will be there. Um, you know, usually what happens with with CMS and the government regulations gets mirrored in uh, commercial insurance. So it's a brighter future. Yeah, and to be clear, just for people that are listening, just because this legislation has been enacted that means we, we kind of open the tap, so to speak, but there isn't necessarily the conduits there that we need to get this information to everyone quickly. So we're just, we're just beginning this process from, from hearing you talk. Yeah, although I, I will, I have more optimistic note on that because remember when we talked about the data, the, the data category that's getting attention is your personal data. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of well-funded startups and well-meaning organizations that are creating the, the receptacles for getting the information. Uh, so the moment the tap opens, I'm pretty sure, you know, and this is not even talking about like large companies like tech, Microsoft or others who may well decide to jump into the personal health record game again. Um, creating those receptacles is not a problem. And I think the world is already gearing towards it. Um, right now, what's in, in those health records or, or, or case files are the data that you generate yourself. Like here's my Fitbit data, you know, here's my daily weight record. It doesn't have my medications that my physician has, but when the information blocking rule allows uh, their electronic record to send it, we'll definitely have the places to put, put that information in. I don't think that that's gonna be a problem. Yeah, no, it's, it's exciting. And it seems very intuitive that you know, your, your health data should be yours to access whenever you want, but it's, it's, not, that, it's not that simple, at least until you know, this, this recent legislation change. No. And I, you know, I think there's a very good analogy that I came up with a few years ago is, you know, whenever we talk about health and healthcare, healthcare data, uh, you can almost always draw parallels with finance and your, your financial information. Cause you know, money is precious to people too. It, you know, it just, does, it has more instant gratification than health, but 
we, we you know, you might have multiple bank record, uh, you know, bank accounts, but you do have something like mint.com or one dashboard that can get it all together. Um, so I, I still want to temper by enthusiasm for, even if we got it together, you know, there are still credit card insolvencies. People don't manage their money well. So it doesn't really mean that we'll, we'll instantly be more healthy. We'll still need the same help that we've needed. It's just that we'll have dashboards that guide us uh, to taking the right action. Um, I feel like uh, creating that dashboard is the current problem to solve. But once that gets solved, we'll still have you know complicated patients that need handholding, although they know you know what the entire history was and what medications they're on. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done, and I think that's where the value moves in health IT is. Oh yeah, anybody can get Palav Sharda's entire medical record for the last 20 years. How do you help me not become a diabetic? Because I am a pre-diabetic at this point, but how do you help me run more, eat better? And that's where the value would be. So I think it's an exciting world. Yeah, yeah. What what you what you do with the data and, yes. and how, how you effectuate it in the real world is much more important than actually having it. You know, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a question here that I'm almost afraid to ask because it might take us in the left field a little bit. But I, I want to just at least get your brief thoughts on it because it seems like having access to your health data is a form of transparency in in, in the medical record. Another thing that's been talked about a lot, and I'm gonna ask the question and put a little more context around it. A lot has been talked about transparency in pricing in mm-hmm. medicine and how technology is facilitating that or at least attempting to facilitate that. So I guess the the question here is, do you feel like this kind of transparency in health data may push transparency in pricing uh, to a little more of a prominent place? Because I feel like although that's that's talked about, it kind of goes through ebbs and flows where that becomes important. So I'm curious, I guess maybe on a high level, from your perspective, what you think of that? Oh, 100%. Um, I feel like Treating healthcare as a business, uh, as a marketplace, will will do us better because having competition. So, high deductible health plans, right? Which in which you have a very high deductible, you pay money out of your pocket before insurance kicks in. Those have been going. You can you can just Google it. High deductible health plan growth, and they've been growing steadily over the last ten plus years. Uh, which means that if I injure my my foot while running and the MRI that I, or x-ray that I have to get done, it'll come out of my pocket, which, you know, actually happened. And I price shopped for the x-ray and I was able to get like 50% less price from another, uh, you know, uh, freestanding imaging center. So price transparency is a a sort of more implicit, but a more solid foundation for, for where we're going with the data. Um, It is, it's, it's actually, it might actually get regulatory tailwinds, you know, given like the state of Senate and House, I can't predict it, but a lot of surprise bills happen because of the lack of price transparency mm-hmm. and surprise medical bills create very powerful moving stories that I think politicians get feel compelled to act on. Um, there are some surprise medical bills in, in, the, uh, in the legislative house but they, they keep like having you know bipartisan issues on it. But sooner sooner than later, I think we might have something that everybody agrees on. Oh, absolutely, price transparency is. I I would actually bet that that happens first, uh, in some way, than um, than actual true data interoperability. Yeah, and I think practically speaking, just for people who are listening that aren't really uh, clued into that that line of conversation is. What you said is the example of it is you shopped around for your imaging on your foot and you paid less money because of it. Most people think in terms of, you know, shopping around for their car or for a TV um, or whatever on Amazon sort from highest to lowest price, but they don't often think about it with healthcare. And part of that is because the pricing isn't quite as accessible as what it is designed to be. There are regulations that suggest that pricing does have to be posted. I just, I've read horror stories of, you know, 25 clicks later on a website, 
you find a pricing list and hopefully technology is something that you know brings. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and technology, not not just technology. I mean, companies like GoodRx are it's amazing. Perfect like, example. Yeah. You know, perfect example. Like not they started from medications, but they're like now doing small procedures that you can just have a upfront pricing for, and and go get it done. And so. I feel like uh, it's again that bundleization, but at a very small level. Where if you needed rhinoplasty, it's for X dollars. It's a very predictable thing to do, and you know, as companies like GoodRx kind of take those peripheral edge, commoditized edges of of healthcare away, uh, there's more value in doing what Mayo Clinic does. Uh, you know, the complicated cancer surgery that you can't really predict in any which way. And they should get paid a lot for doing it because it takes a lot of expertise and a lot of equipment to do it. But this sort of, uh, you know, think of healthcare as, as a comet, you know, like the, the bleeding edge of science, the hot glowing circle keeps moving forward and it's very expensive, but there's a tr- long tail of, of commoditized things that, uh, that should be very predictable and you could just shop for it uh, like you order something from Amazon. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think that's a, empowering for the general consumer to know if, if they haven't considered it, which is this, that, that, that's another whole fascinating discussion you know, in, in and of itself. But I, I want, before we end, a, a couple to finish on a couple last things. The first thing I'd like you to do is there are people listening to this that no doubt are involved in healthcare, um, interested in healthcare innovation. What, what, would, be, what would be your message to those, those entrepreneurs and those innovators out there in, in terms of inspiring them into uh, the next wave of significant iteration and ideation in, in healthcare tech? Uh, this is the time. I feel like the data has, has entered consciousness. consciousness. Um, all the regulations are kind of like freeing the data the ability to process the data is just tri- you know trivially available through cloud providers you know i work for one you could do natural language processing for cents um, and you don't even have to know how to do it like you know the cloud machine learning as a service will do it for you so the substrate and the ability to act on it is almost a commodity now but what you need to understand is what problem you're solving and I've, I've seen and advised and been close to founders who've just taken a very small problem, like canceled appointments for a primary care doc. You know, there, there was a co-founder that was with me in one of my um, startup journeys, and he just focused on that. So how to get last minute appointments with your PCP based on who else ca- canceled. And uh, he's, he's, had a, he, he's having a thriving business. So pick a problem that you think you can solve Everything else is uh, is is ready to be to be given to you. So this is like the golden age of problem solving in in health information technology. I'd really encourage people to jump in. Yes, yeah, such sage advice. Start start with the problem you're trying to solve. I think so often entrepreneurs they start with the solution in mind because we're so technically oriented. But sometimes we, we I know we forget yeah. to tie that to the actual marketable problem that that actually provides the solution. So I think that that's, that's very, very wise advice. Yeah. There's a great saying in, in Silicon Valley. I think the founder of 500 startups said that your solution is not my problem. <laughs> uh, and, and that happens because, you know, we're all so fascinated by like, why isn't there a Uber for nurses? Well, for what context, yeah. you know, if, if it was for my child, like for, for pediatrics, yeah, there should be one, but like Uber for, nurses for uh, a, an elderly geriatric care, maybe not that much because they're usually well, con- you know, there's, so you need to kind of figure out the problem and then find the solution. But you're right. It happens in the reverse most of the times. Awesome. Well, uh, before we get to the final question, I want to make sure people have a chance uh, to know where to find you and, and more information about you and, and the things that you do. So where, where can we go to, to find out more about all the great things you're doing? Oh, well, thank you for the plug. Uh, I'm at palafsharda.com. Like everything that I do is linked through there. Uh, you'll find the Twitter and uh, Quora and even my calendar up there. So would love to talk to people who are interested in health IT. Awesome. And I will link up to that in the show notes. And I will say that 
Olive is very responsive to that. That's exactly how we connected. I just kind of messaged him on LinkedIn and he was gracious enough to uh, be willing to, to grant me some time to talk with him. So he's, he's super responsive and we'll, we'll link that in the show notes. Well, the last question that I want to get to, and it's the question that the entire podcast is based on, and it, I always feel bad leaving the most difficult question for last, but uh, I consider the wellness paradox to be the gap between what we know and what we can actually do in the real world to make a real difference for real people. There, there's that gap that exists between knowing and doing. What would be your advice to health sciences? If you could pick one thing that we could do to close off that gap, what would it be? I think it's more important in healthcare to, to look at the, all the pieces that connect to what you're trying to do. So it's, it's a Rube Goldberg machine, right? If you're trying to do great diagnostic decision support system for, for cancer management, I think it's more important to know, well, how, do, you know, how does somebody get to a cancer, can, you know, cancer diagnosis state? Like, you know, what does their PCP need? Like, what do they need in terms of, uh, of their can, you know, infusion therapy? Like all the pathways that lead away from your problem or to your problem basically end up influencing it. And as technologists, we have this sort of uh, mental model of, well, here's my problem and I've solved it. And the truth in healthcare is that no problem exists on its own, like in a perfect you know, world where it doesn't interact with other things. I mean, I've had situations where diabetics were, 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 were discharged to home and they keep uh, coming back to the ER because they can't get to their second floor bedroom where their actual life is and they because they can't climb the stairs. So knowing where people live, how you know what else affects their life is very important for actually treating their uh, their health ailment. So I think always uh, always look at the interconnections between with other things because they may influence what you're doing disproportionately. It's that's that's my advice. Yeah, nothing nothing exists in a vacuum, uh, and certainly yeah, in healthcare for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great hip surgery, no physical therapy, you're back in the hospital. You know, like, and you know, you you had the best orthopedic surgeon, best you know outcome, but nobody paid attention to physical therapy. Um, So I feel like that's, uh, and once you start doing that, you'll see that everything links to everything else. You know, like you might end up giving fresh groceries to the diabetic because that's cheaper than having them come around two years later uh, in a diabetic coma. So uh, it's, it, it's a, it's a multifactorial equation. It's like, uh, you need to study the whole. Absolutely. Whole well, continuum. Olive, great, great, great insight. Great conversation. Uh, I really appreciate you joining us. Uh, thank you so much for uh, being a part of the podcast. Yeah. Thank you. It was an absolute pleasure. I hope we can do this again. Well, I truly hope you enjoy that conversation as much as I did. If you found it interesting and valuable, please share with your friends and colleagues. Those shares really do make a difference for us. Any information that we talked about during the podcast can be found at the show notes page by going to wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode nine. Please be on the lookout for next week's episode when it drops on Wednesday. And don't forget to subscribe through your favorite podcast platform. Until we chat again, please be well.